Or are, um, Amit, are you the chair of this session or is it uh, oh, Shefali? Is Shefali, she's the chair of the session? That is correct. Okay, okay. Yeah, I mean, I think um, we're going to go live regardless of the, <laughs> do we have a moderator or not? So <laughs> it's going to be interesting. We can, we better get uh, plan B going, you know? Yeah, that's always a good idea to have a plan B. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So I can ask you a question. You can ask me a question. We can all can ask Peggy question. All difficult questions for Peggy, easy ones for me, you know? That's yeah, good. Then, then we run out of time for my question. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's fine. Maybe we can do a, a very quick introductionary round to start with, and then it leaves some time to other people to join in the meantime. Yeah. Yeah, that would be good. I think I I, um, I lead the uh, Dell's global smart city, digital city business, as well as I run the region, Asia, Pacific, and Japan. I serve on um, WEF, Future Cities, and, and uh, APAC, and many other boards as well. So um, that's me. That's my cred to be here. This is my first time with uh, Harassi, so I'm looking forward to it. All right. So, uh, Peggy, you continue. So, uh, I, I'll introduce myself. Mm -hmm. Sure. So, uh, I'm Peggy. I'm from Future City Summit. Future City Summit is a um, uh, organization that's founded in Hong Kong. That it's basically. Um, encourages bottoms up um, smart city development. So we work together with uh, government officials, uh, startups, entrepreneurs, and also nonprofit organizations to launch smart city initiatives from a grassroots level. And uh, recently this year with what's happening in COVID, uh, we launched a few programs that are um, promoting and actually supporting the um, resilience of the tourism industry in some of the most affected Southeast Asian cities, and also um, supported the Manila city government to sign on the G20 Smart City Alliance together with uh, World Economic Forum, WEF. So look forward to sharing more um, with the panel here later today with what we have done. Okay. Right. Um, <laughs> Um, and there's our dear Frank. Good, good afternoon to you. Yes, uh, good, good morning to all of you. I think you're all calling, calling in from Asia. Um, I'm just on the phone with your moderator, and uh, she has difficulties to get in. So I just thought uh, I should uh, give you the green light to start. Yeah. And uh, I hope she will join in a few minutes. All right. Well, we, we, we already took a conclusion, so we were starting an introductionary round. So we'll continue with that if you're okay. Yeah, absolutely. Start to introduce each other and uh, just start, and uh, I will just solve this issue and uh, we'll join in a minute. Yeah, so okay. also, yeah, okay. the yeah. Okay. Yeah. it's in our session this, morning, this day, so thank you for that. Lots of success. Yeah. Um, and I'm, uh, my name is Peter Portheine. I am the uh, co founder of uh, Eindhoven uh, Advisory, and we support uh, regions and cities, especially in Asia in Vietnam and Thailand and Malaysia in regional economic transformation. And that also involves uh, aligning with COVID recovery strategy. And obviously it has a strong relationship with the future development of cities as it comes to planning, residential, but also business uh, outline. And it's also my privilege to join you here this morning. I'm from the Brainport region, which is the, a very small, but let's say uh, a high tech region in the Netherlands. And we are the hometown to companies like uh, NXP, Philips, and ASML. Thank you. That's great. Nice to meet you both. So um, I, I, I think I'll, I'll, start, uh, I'll start by saying, you know, this is uh, great to be in the panel without the moderator. We can have a great chat, coffee side chat between the three of us. And yeah. see how it goes. So um, I'll pull the question to you both, learn from you, and we can do the final stuff across the board. So, Let's, uh, let, let's, let's talk about how has the pandemic changed what you were doing until now um, and in what way? I'll start to you, Peter, and then you can answer this question as well. How has the current pandemic of COVID-19 has changed what you were doing prior to that and how? Well, um, it is uh, my pleasure to, to share a little of our experience, uh, both in Asia, but also working in cities like uh, Belfast in Europe. We're always on the ground where um, 
re regional economic transformation is necessary. For instance, to move from a coal-based economy to a decarbonized economy. These are major transitions which involve uh, developing new economic ecosystems and at the same time also developing new ecosystems for creating purpose for people who already live long time in these regions. And you can imagine that has a strong relationship with a, a transition to a more sustainable energy and a sustainable economy. So these are the main challenges which were already on hand before COVID. And what we are actually trying to do now is uh, using the leverage of COVID in accelerating these economic transformation strategies. That means making the right choices in which direction you are going to develop your future economy, trying to pickpocket uh, the assets you already have and what you can leverage in your future economic outlook and making the right choices which are definitely uh, supported by the path digitalization coming out of COVID, but that at the same time, that also requires um, the right choice in terms of upskilling and reskilling your, your workforce because the needs are changing from the industry side and also the demand from, from these companies. So if we can make an effective alignment between the COVID recovery and also the future strategy for study, uh, that can be very beneficial and then you can make also take the good things out of COVID to help you to create a more sustainable future. And the second development we see is that both, and especially driven by COVID, we see a, a large migration no longer moving into the big cities but also moving into the more surrounding cities and also rural areas where especially digitalization is creating the infrastructure to actually do more work, education and live uh, on a remote basis. So that is creating new perspectives, but it also brings a new way of thinking around the traditional model of big metropolitan areas expanding and expanding, and at the same time facing the problems of a very condensed footprint related to energy, related to the climate, which is now opening new opportunities to rethink the way cities will look like in the near future. That may be. Great, Peggy, you want to go next? Sure, sure. So at Future City Summit, um, before COVID happened, took place, basically uh, we run a really programmed uh, approach for our deliverable with uh, the cities that we serve. That really means that get to gather local knowledge and insights and really the insider information about what is, how a city operates in a particular context and so that type of due diligence work actually served us um, quite well I would say during the COVID times because now that with um, traveling restrictions it is very difficult to um, bring in new relationships and what we can only do is what we have done in the past which is the relationship building and the trust building with these cities to bring in um, credible resources that we have already invested and have some sort of working relationships with and then to launch the program through a virtual platform. So as we all know, um, virtual working or remote working has been very difficult, not only in internal team management, but also external client relationships. And so here, with what we have accumulated in the past, which is the local knowledge, has been the most important thing with it. I feel like after um, the, the COVID and when we get to the recovery stage, which probably some countries are already now in, would be very important to ramp up the sort of um, database or the accumulation of the uh, internal workforce uh, knowledge management. And this would be a key trend for a lot of organizations just like uh, ourselves, the foundation type or the nonprofit type of organization that would need to continue to strengthen our relationships with the and so this leads to the change in our organization, which is data and um, how to use data to drive um, new business opportunities and new collaboration avenues with the cities. So with everything that is stored, with the knowledge and the information and the numbers or, or anything that we have gathered before and then put it in a more organized and structured manner, this helps to inform ourselves of what exactly is the right implementation or what is the right solution to um, address the COVID challenges. And with that, uh, we continue to provide consulting and advisory to the city based on this. And so eventually, I, I feel like from a more um, human-centered approach, it will be further complemented by digital uh, digitalization data and also a data-driven 
way of um, decision making and formulation of strategies to respond to any future challenges that we continue to face, or um, there are new emerging challenges in the next phase of um, the city development. So, with these two, um, are, are basically key changes that our organizations are adapting with, and also supporting our partners, which are the partner organizations that together serve the cities. We also build this type of capability so that we will be stronger and more resilient um, in the recovery stage. Yeah, so um, I think, um, um, as uh, welcome, I think we, we, we have. Uh, Mr. Akbal just joined. I'll have him come to it in a minute. I'm not the moderator. We're having a coffee side chat because our moderator couldn't join us. So we'll, we'll keep going. So let me answer the question. The question was, how has the pandemic uh, affected what you were doing um, before the pandemic and how? So I think the change that we see from a technology perspective is this is the year of acceleration. I think things have accelerated in general. What was going to happen in the next five to 10 years is now happening five to 10 months. Uh, and, and that to me is a positive thing in one, some ways. But then we also have to think about the larger challenges of climate change and sustainability. So digitization, you know, safety, security, uh, creating an urban footprint that everything is within 15 to 20 minutes, more resiliency in that design and technology to keep safety and green energy at the top. Cities have to be the source of power and consumer, consumer both. So I think there's a lot that we can do. And, and what we have seen is digitization is now happening at the accelerated rate and people are open up new ways of doing things. So there's a lot more bolder things that I see today in the marketplace on rethinking the cities and really solving bigger problem than just managing the pandemic which is positive that said it is definitely a big big uh, challenge to be handled with the vaccine administration and 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 continue to manage the current pandemic and any mut mutation that we may see in the future so there's a lot of challenges in the short run to manage but mid to long term i think it looks very positive and uh, what i'm seeing today is a lot more investments and a lot more inquiries about how to be, become more resilient, how do we build a digital core to be able to take care of new ecosystem, and how do we rethink the bigger problems that we may not have been able to do so uh, until now. So I'll stop there. I'm sure we can talk a lot more, but I wanted to make sure I can pass it to Mr. Iqbal if he wants to comment on the same topic. And then I'll let you, Peter, ask a question to all of us, and then we'll go Peggy, and then we'll go back to Mr. Iqbal to ask a question, yeah? Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we would like to uh, address the fact on a very large, uh, on a holistic level, how the tracking of the coronavirus happened and how India fell in line with the other Asian cities and especially the cities of Bangalore and Mumbai, Bangalore, where I live. Now, after a lot of successful strategies with uh, comparing to Singapore, Taiwan, and Hong Kong in battling this pandemic, you know, uh, this was something that we also fell in line. One of the factors that we uh, saw was a lot of medical teams were given to uh, uncover the first details, you know, how the patients contracted the coronavirus and which people they might infect. There were issues, but then everything was, uh, they, it all fell in line. And also, did they travel abroad? You know, did they have a link to any of the clusters of contagion? And, uh, you know, did they cough on someone in the street? Who are their friends and family? In India, we noticed that if there is a person affected or tested positive, there were 100 people calling him, uh, right from the volunteers of the uh, local municipal corporations to the governments, to the health ministry, to the health department. So that was really a concern that people felt that, you know, the government really cares about them by having these kind of mechanisms. And as we see the Western nations struggling with this uh, wildfire spread, uh, Asia's the strategy of Asian cities, especially Singapore and in cities in India, of how they moved rapidly to track down and uh, test the suspected cases. They provided a good model for keeping the epidemic at bay. And uh, of course, it, it can't completely stamp out infections. But with the detailed detective work, the government contract uh, tracers were active. You know, uh, people on the streets and people, volunteers, they formed the largest concentration of volunteers in uh, in understanding this problem. And that is something that is uh, very common in all the Asian cities that we noticed. Thank you. Okay, um, hi everyone, can you hear me now? 
Yeah. Okay, I'm sorry. As you can see, technology is not perfect. So I think we had a firewall issue. So I've actually moved um, to another studio. And uh, I can, I can, uh, I guess, have you guys introduced yourselves already? I'm just wondering. Okay, yes. that's <laughs> Okay, great. Um, so I actually wanted to begin by asking each of you to share a little bit of the work that you're doing in uh, ensuring cooperation between cities. And I think, Asif, you already uh, explained that. Excellent. Yeah. Uh, Amit, may I go to you now to talk about the work we're doing to build cooperation between cities? So, so uh, Chipali, we actually kind of started the fireside chat. Okay. <laughs> Very kind of had the first question answered, which was, "Hey, how has the pandemic affected you?" And, okay. and so, I mean, how has it affected what you were doing before? And and give us a little bit more detail. So we have gone through the introduction, um, mm -hmm. would, and we have introduced ourselves, and uh, I'll pass it to you um, okay. to take it from there. Okay, great. So um, I'll begin with the discussion itself. So it's uh, there's a Brookings Institution report I was reading on the cooperation between cities, and it says that some 300 networks have already been formed to allow cities to cooperate um, uh, since the 1980s. Uh, so there are cities like Mulan, which have been receiving masks from Wuhan, Bristol from Guangzhou. But I was just wondering, from your experience, are cities really cooperating to contain the pandemic? But the pandemic is still spreading. So do you get the feeling that cities are indeed cooperating, or is there scope to do a lot more? I think there has to be a doing a lot more. I'll just pick one example of how it has to be done. Uh, for example, if I have a uh, travel bubble being created or green lanes being created between two cities from an air travel perspective, I have to be tested uh, in the city of departure, in the city of arrival. I have a, you know, I have to make sure that on the other end I get tested again when I'm departing and I have to get tested again after I arrive. So to me, I think there is no, if that that seems excessive. And if the cities could work together and we could agree on common standards, um, then hopefully the testing will improve as well. So we can actually get to reduce the number of testing required and the and the um, uh, overhead it has in terms of time and the material and the cost and not to say the wastage you know um, but but that's just one example I think informational cooperation is happening a lot more than physical today but there's no common standards that have come about that, that trust can be built so I'll Excellent. Um, I totally agree with you. It's a question of trust. It's also a question of standards. I think a lot more work needs to be done on that front, but that is going to be difficult because the standards for health itself, health monitoring vary from country to country. But I'd like to invite uh, Peter, Asif, Peggy to share your thoughts on that. Well, uh, as we... yeah, yeah, I think Peter, yes. Oh, I'm fine. <laughs> um, uh, well, I give I give you a little experience from Europe. That's uh, the other geography. Uh, mm -hmm. We're already struggling to have a kind of unified policies on the European level. Although we think the EU is uh, still one one region, um, so we have different countries in Europe, also neighboring countries, who are applying different restrictions and policies in the way they handle and try to manage the contamination and the spread of the virus. Which leads into the uh, the strange situation that last weekend uh, we are in a in a partial lockdown, so shops are still open with some limitations. But our neighboring country, Belgium, have a full lockdown on shops. So we have a large influx of uh, all kind of migrant uh, shoppers during the weekend for Thanksgiving, which overcrowded our already populated cities. So they, there they have to have an intervention to close down the borders and close down the cities and close down the shops. So we see it on a on a local scale, on a national level, where it's already hard. Let's not to say uh, on a inter, on a re regional level. If you think about the situation between major cities, so we have not a unified traveling bubble in Europe between the major airports, the major cities, 
Um, so, and I think you can see the same in, in Southeast Asia, where on one hand, as ASEAN is uh, like an economic cooperation and still struggling to find a kind of unified uh, way in treating, for instance, the air, the air restrictions and the travel restrictions, which can uh, obviously open up economy much faster if we have a kind of contained region in which you already start to allow some level of traveling, uh, where there are now big differences, for instance, between Singapore and Vietnam, where Vietnam is fully closed down and still difficult to get in for experts, for investors, which on the medium term uh, will have actually influence the level of investment and all kinds of other expansions we'll be needing to actually have a successful recovery strategy out of the present crisis. So that is an observation I have and uh, that is quite difficult to manage um, and even on a country level, but uh, no, and even more on, on an inter-regional level. And I'd like to hear your experience. Yeah, in fact, uh, Singapore and Hong Kong have been working on a travel bubble to allow people to move from one city to another. But just on the eve of that bubble, um, the flare up happened again and they had to decide to postpone it till early December. But sadly, in Hong Kong, the number of cases is going up. And I see Peggy nod nodding her head there. And I'm sure she wants to contribute on that. Asif, I'll come back to you next on this. Sure. Peggy, go ahead. Yeah, I've been looking forward to the uh, opening up of the um, travel borders. So definitely it was a disappointment when um, that travel arrangement between Hong Kong and China is delayed. Um, I, I absolutely agree with uh, what you all have shared just now with uh, the challenges and difficulties of managing the um, intercity kind of uh, cooperation in this particular incident during the COVID situation. Um, but here I, I would just want to share a little bit experience that uh, we have observed uh, that's what's going on in China. Of course, it's very, very difficult different um, with the uh, adoption of the different types and, and, and extent of measures that have been used in China. But one interesting um, thing I, I thought it would be um, maybe a food for thought for our audience here is that how cities within China cooperate with each other um, in terms of um, mitigating the risks of um, pandemic. So when um, still small spikes in different places such as Qingdao, Tianjin, and now probably in Shanghai have seen um, a resurgence of very few um, COVID cases, but because of what's happening, so people are getting a bit nervous. Um, I would say the, the government has um, used an approach which is um, to actually um, ask the different provinces within China to support one particular city to manage the different cycles and the peaks of the spikes that uh, require different uh, or a higher intensity of medical resources and medical like basically professionals to support one city. So in that sense, like it helped to um, facilitate the cooperation between cities because when one place um, got a resurgence of cases then other provinces or other surrounding cities would uh, be responsible for taking care of say one particular district and to bring in uh, medical resources and professionals to that place to support so in that sense when uh, because it's very difficult for all the places to have to have a spike at the same time so with all these different spikes at span across like a period of time then that it will be a more flexible arrangement of these medical resources that allow the cooperation of these cities um, to happen but of course it's a very special or different circumstances when it comes to a regional scale because there are different country specific concerns but at least within one country that is probably still uh, manageable and, and feasible um, to to help relieve some of the stress and, and pressure in the healthcare system um, that is caused by COVID. Yeah, that's that's quite interesting. I remember about China. Soon after all the cases were controlled in Hubei and Wuhan and all, there was a flare up somewhere in the north and east. Uh, and um, you know, I could see that city, cities were moving very rapidly share resources, to share knowledge, to be able to control the disease. But that absolutely you're right. It all happened within a country and that was possible. But I'm really not sure if it is possible, you know, uh, between countries. And actually, Asif, if I can ask you, how's the experience been in India? Are cities cooperating to try and contain the pandemic? Well, uh, yes. Uh, thanks very much, Arshi. Yeah, they are doing this uh, quite a bit. 
in a sense that they are understanding the infrastructural needs of the different parts of the city's municipalities and as we said you know there are a lot of those um, departments involved and uh, from time and again you see certain conflicts arising between the health ministry from the interior ministry uh, you know trying to put the blame on each other and when something good happens recovery happens there is a you know uh, there is a, a situation where they would like to take the credit because of a lot of these kind of laws that have been suddenly uh, created by the government and lot of those legalities and not being able to uh, you know interpret those legalities however uh, what has happened is uh, the state responses have uh, remained shrouded with panic you know as the impact of the disease on health uh, you know on the economy uh, it was it was previously unseen under normal circumstances conventionally however now that it is being seen it is a challenge like everywhere else but they have followed the direction from different cities especially from a uh, lot of other cities uh, in asia in uh, they, they have taken clues from singapore they have taken it from uh, places where there have been some very good recoveries special teams were uh, you know deployed to study what is happening in the places with good recovery and to understand the weaknesses that are there in the places where there has been a uh, lot of cases and a lot of positive uh, uh, you know uh, reports happening there uh to begin with we had the nationwide lockdown which was like a combative strategy you know regulated by the guidelines under the disaster management act and covid was declared as a notified disaster you know so the definition of the covid being a disaster was a very good move by the ministry of home affairs which was taken by them and uh, how they defined this whole thing with the legalities and the whole country did uh, have a successful lockdown for almost uh, a continuous two months a two and a half months and how the indian legislative framework met the objective of public health during this epidemic was also very important and whether it met met the requirements in terms of surveillance preparedness and control of disease these are all were addressed in a very very meticulous manner and i think we must really praise the, the way the bureaucracy uh, worked on this by using the epidemic diseases act uh, to you know to punish and to penalize people uh, by the you know government to curb the spread of this uh, plague especially in the city of bombay it was very very uh, strongly implemented with the most draconian pieces of legislation ever ever adapted in uh, this part of uh, india during this colonial period so it was something new for everybody and yes it was quite successful that i would say okay that's good to hear i know you were talking about some work you are doing with mayors but is the cooperation really happening at very senior levels of the government because the number of cases in india is really flaring up right well yes the numbers of cases are flaring up but in the last one week we have had a lot of reduction in cases especially in places like delhi and bangalore where uh, you know the, the the reasons have been you know there is a sudden act of implementation of various rules and regulations after which sudden drop down is there so the people the society or oh, at large has to cooperate with the social distancing system and with the kind of uh, you know the action and the movement that has been uh, you know implemented so because contact tracing that has been found uh it is quite uh, serious here and they are taking all the steps uh, to say that they need to keep ahead of the virus and if you chase the virus you will always be behind the curve is the kind of belief that uh, the government has been implementing uh, to people uh so we have recorded only a handful of deaths though even the cases of positive but handful of deaths and uh, relatively few, few cases compared to in the west in the united states or in italy or in let's say other parts where there have been a lot of effect Uh, even though they continue to face risks as people from emerging hotspots uh, who carry the virus with them there are strong controls on people entering uh, india with different airports there is not much of travel in fact uh, we saw bombay uh, you know imposing some new uh, uh, you know new rules the uh, three days back by saying that everybody has to be tested negative if they want to enter so uh, so people are obviously don't want to travel and they are just reducing travel so by placing these restrictions i think it's things are improving and they have laid heavy fines now and special marshals are being allocated to impose fines on people and uh, the fines have started from 500 a few months back to now it is 2000 so people are really concerned uh, you know not to want to pay this kind of penalties and they are just following the rule the way it is right. so that way it's been quite successful uh amit if i can turn to you uh just looking at what is happening i want you to share your thoughts on is digital technology really being effectively used between cities between countries to contain the pandemic yeah i think we kind of have gone from first of all the pandemic is driven by management is driven by three things so people is the government and is the healthcare system so this is the trifecta So if the people do not 
follow the rules. There's nothing, there's limited stuff that healthcare or governments can do to manage it. And same thing is true for the other two nodes in this as well. And that's why this problem is more complex, where people believe that they have a choice to make on the individual basis or the societal basis. Now, those things will take a long time to manage. Um, and I think my view at this time is the technology has to say, wearing a mask or anything else that we believe or we know so far that saves lives is like seatbelt. You know, if we want to drive at a faster speed, we need to have certain protections. But in this case, it's not just the protection for yourself, it's protection for everyone around you. So this actually has a much bigger scenario, a much bigger societal value if someone needs to wear seat, uh, to mask. Now, technology today, we are providing already technology where people can see who's walking into office without mask, who's keeping social distancing or not. Uh, similarly, I'm sure we will create, we will agree to a blockchain-based standard by which we know who has taken vaccination, who has not. Many of the airlines have come about and said that they would like to only board the uh, passengers who have been vaccinated. You know, like this is the conversation for next year, second half for international travel. I think those are kind of all the things are going to be driven by technology. This is not a human scale problem. We cannot solve this by hiding more people and saying, please enforce this, cannot be done. And thus, this is a machine scale problem. So fundamentally, we have to think about all of these policies implementation through the machines that we can install or uh, integrate in, in our society, but also make sure privacy is there and make sure digital security is there. Yeah, I mean, uh Discipline is something that is going to take long to sort of make it part of any society. But um, given what happens with the pandemic and uh, how rapidly it spread between cities, between countries, we don't have time to instill that. So what should be done? I know Singapore is experimenting with the Trade Together app, and uh, we're trying to make it open to all ASEAN countries. It's an open source information. You see how we're doing it, and then you can learn from it. There is a smart a ASEAN smart cities network. But perhaps digitally, there are other things also that can be done that can enable people to learn from each other. Yeah, I think first and foremost, uh, the technology implementation like Trace Together help governments respond faster to contain something. But fundamental issue we have is we still do not understand the entire epidemiology of virus. We do not understand exactly how this is, this is still escaping. Unless we have the vaccine that is available and unless we understand virus better, I think a lot of digital technologies will be seen with distrust um, because we still saying, what what is the sufficient condition by which we can say this will not spread further? We do not know that those yet, right? And and I think this is why it's going to take another six months for trust to be built and technology infrastructure to be established. It's not like technology doesn't exist today, but I think there is a lot more we do not know. Thus, whatever you're codifying into machines, that's not sufficient, and the people don't trust it. And even with the trace together, initially there was a lot of response from the citizens of Singapore to say, are we sure this protects my information? And are we sure this is this is secure? And I think some changes were made after that. So I'm glad if those changes were made, but I think that's a second source of distrust on the technologies unless we can prove that this creates keeps the privacy and this is secure. So I think within six months we'll be there, we'll understand this whole phenomena better. We will get this get the, the infrastructure established as well, and we'll make sure security and, and the privacy is there. All three things have to be done. Absolutely. Peggy, is a building trust part of the modeling you do, you know, when you get groups of people together to work on Future City Summit? Sir, can you repeat the question? Sure. Um, I wanted to know um, how much of importance do you attach to building trust? as you and your team work together for the Future City Summit? 
Sure, sure. So within um, a period of uh, five years, I would say, since the establishment of the Future City Summit, we have already got into our network uh, 30 uh, city partners that uh, are spread across Asia and in most of them in developing markets. And so the way that we build trust together with them is not to be a standalone subject matter expert. Um, we don't want to say we are just advising you on a particular matter in water and sanitation or in transport, but try to um, give a holistic understanding first to the um, cities that telling them that, okay, we try to understand your problem in a really holistic way and comprehensive way instead of just siloing ourselves into one particular matter. And with that, um, because the world is getting more and more complex, not not just because of COVID, but before that already, there are a lot of cross-disciplinary or very diverse subjects that touch on uh, multiple disciplines. And so in that way, the trust of understanding the nuances of how these actors interplay or how these different social economic factors interplay will be very important in the as a way of so, as a main source of getting trust um, from these cities and and once you're able to speak the local language as in understanding um, what the differences the small differences that are like compared to uh, city A and city B, then we'll be able to say, okay, we are now here to provide a solution to develop your unique DNA for the city. Because all the cities do not want to have a cookie cutter to say that, okay, we'll just follow one successful example, and then we'll try to um, build our way towards that. They still want to keep and preserve their personality as a city and to keep their DNA. And so with that, if you understand the mentality of the decision makers and the people living in that city, then this is already the one of the uh, better ways to, to obtain trust and uh, it will be serving you for a longer period of time. Peter, is that the experience in Europe as well? Where to yeah. build trust? you need to focus a lot more on keeping the individual identities, understanding? Um, I will, I'll give you an interesting example. Um, in addition to my work in Asia, I'm also the uh, director of the Brainport Smart District, which is a, a living lab we are building here in the Brainport region for a space dedicated to urban development. And it really takes all these individual transitions like energy mobility and uh, also transfer to a more circular way of constructing our future cities into a holistic system so we're building a test bed uh, which allows the application of many of these let's say vertical technologies and take it into one more integrated approach but the most important uh, stream we have is about uh, the social innovation and participation because if you want to build trust, it means that you have to involve people, not at the end of the design circle, but at the start. And so the end user will become the user at the beginning. So we are taking a lot of effort and also pride in uh, developing all kinds of participatory design streams in which we actually engage future citizens in the way they help us to find a way we're going to build their future city. And it also means that the social innovation part helps many big companies who are participating in this project to actually iterate their prototype services and products on their way to the market. So that's where we try to inverse the whole design circle, allow real life testing in an environment where eventually like 5,000 people will be living. So it's a small neighborhood. And at the same time, it also allows to find all these challenges about integrating technology but also integrating systems because we are changing the energy system we are changing the way we move and we also change the way we think about the circular economy other use of materials try to uh, close the loop on waste close the loop the wood the loop on water and we have to manage that all in an integrated way because the system is not just a, a number of in technology solutions but it's an integrated system which eventually have to uh, uh, provide you with a, with a very pleasant uh, environment where you can live and work. And live and work is another one. Um, we see more and more a hybrid approach in the way we think about future cities. This is no longer limited to the place where I live or the place where I move to for my work. These are merging together. And if they merge, also the systems supporting them are merging from an ICT perspective, um, from a governance perspective. So that is the way we try to build the trust base in the way we actually engage future citizen in the way we're trying to design these new system approaches, which definitely also um, involve uh, a lot of behavioral change, which is necessary to make all these technology transitions 
be adapted and become uh, successful and deliver their value. I get the feeling that it's way easier when you're trying to build a future city. But the reality is many of the existing cities have been built over centuries. So urban planning is a big issue that we need to tackle. And I'm wondering, like in Europe, you know, how do you, you know, sort of take the lessons from the future cities that you're building and try and transform the lives of people in existing cities? Um, well, you're uh, spot on. Um, in, in my province, we have like uh, 800,000 houses which are already built, which are not sustainable and under very low energy consumption, high energy consumption level. There is no business case to actually transform all these existing places into sustainable, let's say, energy efficient houses. We are trying to figure out ways to do that. And you obviously see that transformation is always much more costly than if you can start in a greenfield. So that is a, a head start for those cities and regions in the world where we are still expanding and building new cities. On the other hand, we also learned by COVID that these new city areas and the surrounding uh, rural uh, environment is now also merging together. So there is also a big challenge for all these new greenfield cities to find a kind of integrated connection with the surrounding areas and also the rural part of the country, which is obviously a, a big challenge from a, an urban planning perspective. But on the other hand, if your metropole area is very condensed and the space is very scarce, there's always an opportunity and also a, a logical driver to look for the surrounding areas to interconnect on a regional level. Right. Um, we have only about four minutes left, but I want to turn your attention to the vaccines. There's a lot of coming uh, with uh, Oxford, AstraZeneca, with Pfizer and Moderna, all talking about, you know, all their tests having a 90 percent uh, uh, result, which is uh, uh, we're hoping that uh, all in the market. I want to ask you, how is it possible to use digital, digital technology to our advantage to ensure that the vaccine, when they actually hit the market, can be shared with wider populations across cities between countries? Is that possible? I think this is a quite a bit of political issue, but I'll just not take the political issue as much as I'll take the uh, practical and uh, practical issue. So first and foremost, we know what are the more vulnerable population, uh, healthcare, elderly, people with the complicating diseases, um, certain, certain groups uh, of people. So whatever that we know, we need to put science first. We need to think about that as the critical challenge. Uh, and the people who have to probably travel more also may be included in that. Because if you need to restart the economic engine somewhere, that has to be there. But at the same time, um, for us to say that, that everyone has the same right and pick a random number and your number comes, I think may not be the right answer in this. Now, clearly, I think the noise in the system is quite high to say, well, it should be completely democratic, no matter where the vaccine was, uh, was designed or, or invented or where it's manufactured, everyone should get the same right. I think we can probably find a, a right answer which protects our most vulnerable first. Think about then the what will drive the economic model. And third, ensure that you don't have to really administer this every six months. I mean, is the antibodies there to last for a year or longer? So that way we can push this same amount of production over a lot more doses. Those are kind of three things I'll make the point about. Would anyone like to share words? Asa, Peter, Becky? Well, uh, yeah, I mean, we, we just had our prime minister visiting the three facilities yesterday of the vaccination. Uh, he visited Pune, Hyderabad and all the three places and they're also working out and he made it very clear that, you know, there is no politics, but they let the scientific temperament take over the situation. Because considering what happened in the United States uh, during the Trump's regime and uh, cases rising up has mainly been due to a lot of conflicting opinions in different states. So that is not happening here. And I think everybody as a society, we should be responsible to handle this and, uh, you know, do it in a very responsible manner considering the scientific temperament and the scientific issues that are at hand. And we must go by the scientific evidences. That's what I feel. Sure. Peggy, what are your thoughts on that? 
China and Hong Kong? Um, I, I'm no expert in, in this area, but um, I agree with what um, both speakers have shared, like science would be the dominant driver. And I think like the, the society has already seen enough um, damage uh, caused by the virus and would really want to see a relief or a cure at this point of time to, to need that. So I think um, the social support in, in, in this um, uh, action would also be a prerequisite of uh, the wide implementation of this. Mm -hmm. Peter? Uh, well, I'm, I'm happy we really here in Europe. We have a, a European policy in uh, also the application of the vaccines and also the buying of the vaccines. It's a national uh, government responsibility, which also uh, allows for an inclusive uh, approach of the whole vaccination program. I think that should not be on the market. It should be a government driven decisions. Also in the way we are going to take, starting with the vulnerable groups within our society, and also make sure that we have an inclusive approach which allows everybody to actually receive the vaccine. And I see differences between the different vaccines that, like AstraZeneca, is employing a more, let's say, inclusive model, well, they're also focusing on uh, providing vaccine to those countries who are less privileged and have less access to these large vaccination technologies and programs. So that is what I see as a privilege uh, in the way Europe at least uh, approaches the vaccination program where we're doing a bad thing and to spread and manage to contaminate. Actually, I wanted to move on to life beyond the pandemic, but our time is up. I really look forward to talking to all of you on another occasion. <clears throat> but thank you so much for joining in today. Thanks very much, Shafali. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you. 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 Thank you.